Good morning. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, May 12th. Joining us today are the Minister of Health and Social Services, the Honourable Tracy Ann McPhee, and UConn's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brendan Hanley. Our sign language interpretation is provided by Mary Thiessen and French language translation by André Boursier. Uh, we will follow, uh, after our speakers, we will go to the phone lines and uh, entertain questions from reporters. You will each have two calls, two questions, and we will call you by name. Before we begin, if any of the reporters are having difficulty hearing, please email ecoinfo at yukon.ca. Minister McPhee. Thank you, Pat. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us here on the traditional territory of the Kwanlan Dun First Nation and Ta'an Kwachan Council. I'm very pleased to be here as the new Minister of Health and Social Services with Dr. Hanley this morning for today's COVID-19 update. I also want to acknowledge that this is National Nursing Week and send sincere thanks and appreciation to all those who have chosen the nursing profession and who care for us all each and every day. Yesterday, we announced two new cases of COVID-19. One is here in the territory and one is outside the territory and that person will remain outside the territory until they have recovered. Thankfully, we have only one active case, but this is a reminder that we remain vulnerable to COVID-19 here in the Yukon. What we are seeing in our sister territories is also a stark reminder of how vulnerable our northern communities are and how quickly things can change if we are not careful. We all need to continue to take precautions by following the safe six plus one. Maybe it's plus two now that we have vaccines. Following the safe six and masking up is the best way to prevent the spread of COVID-19, but getting vaccinated will help us all and will allow us slowly but surely to move beyond the pandemic. Yukoners have done a fantastic job of taking their shot. Nearly 75% of eligible Yukoners have received their first shot and 66% have received their second shot. This is phenomenal news. I wanna send a big thank you to all of the dedicated staff working on the vaccine rollout team, as well as our community partners across the territory who have helped us roll out the vaccine so successfully. Since our announcement last week with Dr. Hanley and the Premier, we have seen nearly 500 more individuals get their first shots. Let's keep going. We are truly leading the country when it comes to vaccinations. Our fellow Canadians are watching as we bravely forge a path towards recovery. The pandemic has been a challenging journey and we have seen or oh, sorry, we have been um, on for what seems like really, truly forever. And when vaccines were approved, we all celebrated. The only drawback has been that vaccines were only approved for adults until now. That changed on the 5th of May when Health Canada approved the Pfizer vaccine for use in, in individuals aged 12 and up. We know that Yukon parents are eager to get their children vaccinated as soon as possible, and we've been working on how to include youth in our vaccine rollout plans. Today, I'm so pleased to announce that we have made arrangements with the federal government to obtain enough Pfizer vaccine doses to get all Yukon youth aged 12 to 17 vaccinated. There are 2,000 641 Yukoners in this age group and almost 2,100 of them are located in or around Whitehorse. We are developing a robust plan to deliver the Pfizer vaccine to our territory's youth. Our goal is to provide safe, efficient and low barrier access to the vaccine for youth 
while being mindful of the staffing and the vaccine logistical challenges. In the coming weeks, our dedicated health professionals will be visiting nearly every Yukon community to host a youth vaccine clinic. Our plan will ensure that all youth ages 12 and up will receive their first shot before the end of the school year and while youth are still in their communities. The plan will see youth fully vaccinated by mid-July. We know that offering only one opportunity in a community will not work for everyone. Medical travel will be supported for, for travel to Whitehorse or outside of your community for youth who are unable to attend the vaccine clinic that will be held in their community. Our youth have made incredible contributions to keeping our community safe over the course of this pandemic. Our community isn't fully protected until our children and youth are. Vaccinating youth will protect them and prevent them from spreading COVID-19 in our communities. We know from events in other parts of the country that variants are hitting younger and healthier people. Even a mild case of COVID-19 can have long-term effects. The Northwest Territories started vaccinating 12 to 17 year olds last week and other places across Canada are starting to vaccinate youth. Here in the Yukon, we are fortunate to be able to secure enough vaccine doses to immunize our youth in the coming weeks. I'm encouraging all youth and parents to take advantage of this incredible opportunity and to make the choice to vaccinate now. Taking your shot will protect you, your family, your community, and your future. We've had amazing success in vaccinating adults across the territory. Today, we are releasing the vaccination numbers by community. We recognize that there are some communities and age groups with lower vaccination rates. Every community and age group is, has different dynamics and will have a different app impact about vaccinations. We are continuing to work with our partners in communities and First Nations on how to best address vaccine hesitancy on a community by community basis. And we'll be engaging with healthcare providers, community leaders, and youth to find out how to best address their concerns and continue our vaccination efforts. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. I'll now turn to our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Hanley, for some further remarks about this exciting announcement. Thank you, Minister McPhee, and good morning, bonjour. In Yukon, as Minister McPhee uh, just announced, we recently confirmed a, a new case linked to uh, out-of-territory travel, and that individual is isolating and doing well. And uh, this time, we're not concerned about any possibility of public exposure. And as you heard, the second case is a Yukoner who contracted COVID outside of Yukon and was diagnosed and will remain out of territory until free of infection. And as Minister McPhee also said, the individual counts in numbers but is not considered an active case in Yukon. So yes, within weeks, we will begin immunizing 12 to 17 year olds with the Pfizer vaccine. And that question, when will we vaccinate our kids, has probably been the most common question I've had over the last couple of weeks. So I know that parents and young people alike will join me in celebrating this good news. And once again, our immunization planning team has come through with making access for 12 to 17 year olds to vaccine a reality. And once again, our team of immunizers and supporting staff will be stepping forward to move swiftly through communities, vaccinating young people. Now, for those who may not wish to or be able to get children vaccinated at this time, we do anticipate that Moderna will be approved and available for the same age group later on this summer. 
But I do encourage all parents uh, of youth in this age group to take advantage of this opportunity to protect more Yukon citizens. Every vaccine adds another layer of protection to the community as well. So the vaccine team is currently finalizing the plan and we should be able to expect that uh, to share that information shortly. Now Pfizer and Moderna are very similar messenger RNA or mRNA vaccines. And although Yukon, uh, we, in Yukon we were pleased to accept Moderna as a better fit initially for the challenges of moving around the territory when we first began vaccinations, Pfizer has become easier to handle with, with their subsequent regulatory applications and approvals. Although it still requires long-term storage at ultra-cold temperatures, the Pfizer vaccine can now be released from that minus 70 to normal freezer temperatures long enough to move around over a matter of days. <clears throat> so it's become more similar in handing, handling requirements to Moderna. Of course, some extra training will be required for Pfizer for our immunizers. And we will be working with approximately a one month dosing interval between the first and second doses. So we anticipate, as Minister Murphy said, that this cohort of young people will have received both doses of Pfizer by the middle of July. Getting vaccinated is one of the best ways we can protect ourselves, our loved ones and our community against COVID-19. And I'm thrilled that adolescents and youth are going to have this extra layer of protection. Yukon's vaccine numbers are hoveringly, ta hovering tantalizingly close to 75% of the eligible adult population receiving their first dose and 66% their second dose. And I also want to join uh, Minister McPhee in thanking every Yukoner who has taken time out of their day to get immunized. We should be proud of our collective effort to near this milestone of 75% in just over four months. And in our older age groups, we have gone much further. I'm glad to see that the recent news of reduced self-isolation for those who are fully vaccinated has brought some excitement back into the territory and even more pleased to see that spike in our uptake for immunization that the minister described. If we keep this up, you Connors, we will continue to have much more to look forward to in the coming weeks. Now, if you've been watching our numbers closely, you will note that the numbers by percent have not increased since last week. And this is because we have a new denominator using data from December 2020 instead of last June, recognizing Yukoners, uh, Yukon's steadily growing population <clears throat> and adding a few hundred people to the number for eligible adults. With the ongoing daily numbers of people coming for first doses, we're going to get past 75% soon. And each age group slowly continues to climb in uptake. I also need to give my heartfelt thanks to our team of immunizers, community nursing staff, and everyone who has been involved behind the scenes in making this work. And this has been a difficult year, and people have been tireless in their efforts to get as many doses into as many arms as possible. So thank you to all of you who are selflessly investing so much time and energy into ensuring a smooth vaccination campaign. And as this is National Nursing Week, I would like to add my congratulations to all nurses in Yukon. The theme for Nursing Week this year in Canada is called uh, We Answer the Call. And surely there's been no year to compare to this one where nurses around the country have truly answered the call to serve. Our Yukon nurses have demonstrated such strength, perseverance, kindness, innovation and compassion as they have weathered the challenges of this pandemic. Whether in frontline hospital care, in community clinics, in our CTAC testing and assessment center, whether in the front line of public health, or in the convention center, or the mobile teams, or in the rural health centers around Yukon immunizing people, not just with COVID vaccines, but with all the vaccines to keep us and our children protected. 
whether in community nursing, providing care in our health centres and public health centres around Yukon, whether serving in our long-term care facilities or helping in home care, whether in managing clinical teams in preventative care or administration, there could be no health in Yukon without nurses anchoring that care. And without the dedication of our nurses throughout the territory, we would not be where we are today. Now, as we approach the 75% first dose uptake numbers, I do want to talk about our goals. 75% uptake is fantastic. And yes, we still have more to go. Our younger adults are coming forward in higher numbers, and I hope that we continue so that we see all age groups achieve 75% or more. Our second doses are still in progress, but I would like second dose uptake to closely match first dose uptake. One dose is not enough to reliably protect any one individual. We have differences by region and community and having as high and even an uptake across all age groups and all communities as possible is going to be better for all of us. We have children to vaccinate, first our youth 12 and up and eventually our younger children. It's important to know that there is no one target number where we reach and then stop. I want to make sure that everyone who lives or stays or works in Yukon has a chance to access vaccine, and ideally, our numbers will continue to climb. In return, we will be able to talk about further relaxations of restrictions soon as we approach summer. Canada, as you heard uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, talk about yesterday, is getting ready for a first dose summer. In Yukon, we will be able to enjoy a second dose summer if over the next few weeks people continue to come forward for vaccine that haven't already. For now, we need to keep public health measures in place, physical distancing and safe six and masks. As numbers rise, as evidence builds, as Canada approaches stable COVID activity and higher vaccine uptake, life will get better. When Canada gets to second dose fall, I hope that we can join with all Canadians in looking forward to further lifting of the remaining public health measures. For now, let us continue to proceed with care. As we lift restrictions and look forward to more freedom, the public health measures that have helped keep us safe for the past 14 months will remain. In light of our announcement last week, I want to clarify some questions around self-isolation and public health measures. First, to discuss the easing of restrictions to self-isolation coming into place on May 25th. As the Premier and I announced last week, any Canadian resident who is fully vaccinated will be exempt from self-isolation if they are arriving or returning from domestic travel into Yukon from domestic travel within Canada. Fully vaccinated means with a Health Canada approved vaccine and two weeks after the second dose. While I know many of us are itching to go to see our friends or go fishing or get to our boats in Haines and Skagway, I want to clarify that th this does not apply to international travel. The international border with the US remains closed with the exception of those passing through or for essential travel. Canada still has a federal quarantine measure in place, meaning that if you were in the midst of planning a road trip to Alaska, you will still be required to self-isolate for 14 days and provide two COVID-19 tests during your isolation period back here as per the federal mandate. Territorial versus federal guidance is different. Yukoners can travel domestically without self-isolation in those circumstances that we described, but must abide by federal quarantine guidance. Secondly, I want to address public health measures as a whole and why we need to continue to follow them. I know some people are asking why they should maintain distance or wear masks. And I do understand that people think if they are vaccinated, that should be enough, particularly after over a year of doing this. So I have to say not yet. To do so too early is still risky and could still result in either outbreaks or susceptible people getting ill. 
Both our territorial neighbours are demonstrating that outbreaks and spread of COVID are still a possibility with ongoing importation of cases if we don't continue preventative measures. We are close, but not so close yet that vaccination alone is enough to protect us. What we need is to continue to apply public health measures, the safe six plus one until, until we have high and uniform vaccine uptake across our population, until we have successfully phased in reopening measures gradually, and until Canada reaches low levels of COVID activity and high vaccine uptake rates. COVID is always there and ready to hit susceptible pockets, especially when we least expect it. For now, please continue to wear a mask in those spaces where it's um, prescribed. And you need to continue to physically distance from those outside of your bubble. You need to keep your bubble small and stay home and get tested when you are sick. Public health measures will be part of our lives to some extent for the next few weeks, perhaps months. We are taking significant steps forward towards reopening. But if at the same time we disregard our safety net, we may face resurgence and have to reimpose restrictions for longer. Without a doubt, this virus has reshaped the way we interact, the way we gather, the way we work, and the way we travel. But not forever. We're getting close to phasing back to normal. With testing and contact tracing, we have to date done well and had been a, we have been able to contain any active cases quite quickly. Our success depends on Yukoners getting tested when they have symptoms that could be COVID-19. If Yukoners are sick and choose not to get tested, our stable condition could be compromised. I know that seeking testing can be inconvenient for a variety of reasons, and our teams are actively working towards improving the overall testing process. With online booking systems and extended hours, it's a priority to us that people in Whitehorse can easily access SeaTac when they need it. And of course, testing is also available throughout rural Yukon. To further streamline our efforts, we recently introduced an online tool that allows Yukoners to receive their negative COVID-19 test results online. Individuals who are awaiting a test result can access their online result via yukon.ca by entering their health, care, health card number and birth date. And individuals will be able to access their negative test results or receive confirmation if results are not ready and remain under review. Now, if you do test positive, you will be contacted directly. Your online result will read as not ready, and YCDC, or Yukon Communicable Disease Control, will follow up personally with individuals who test positive to ensure they are informed promptly and instructed on next steps. To access the tool, you can go to yukon.ca and the Get COVID-19 Test Result. I hope this will make the process of getting tested just a little bit more seamless and easier for you, Connors. So that's it for today. We've had positive news today and more positive news to come in future updates. Please take care of each other. Remember to be grateful for what we have in Yukon and stay well. Thank you. Merci. Thank you, Minister McPhee. Thank you, Dr. Hadley. We'll move now to reporters, and we will start with uh, Jackie Hong, CBC. Hello. Um, my first question, I think, would be for Minister McPhee, but of course, Dr. Hanley, jump in. Um, I'm wondering why the community vaccination rates are being released now. I know there were concerns um, earlier when we asked for the numbers that this might pit communities against each other. So I'm wondering what conversations happened that you're comfortable releasing these numbers now? Uh, what patterns are you seeing in these numbers? And also you mentioned uh, reaching out to communities on a community, co community basis to address he vaccine hesitancy. How is that gonna work? Who is doing that work? 
Um, well, I'm happy to start with some of the pieces of that question, but then I'm sure Dr. Henley has more I information. Um, of course, uh, being new to the role, I can't tell you uh, some of the answers to those questions because I just don't have that information. But what I'm happy to say is that um, during the entire uh, course of the pandemic, uh, which as we've said, it seems like forever now, I'm sure it does to everyone in, in Yukon. Um, we have been uh, regularly in touch with uh, First Nations chiefs uh, and councils, leaders in their communities, as well as with um, municipalities and their councils and mayors uh, on a uh, sometimes more than weekly basis, but certainly a weekly basis. So we speak to them about the announcements that come forward. We speak to them about uh, rollouts. Uh, we speak to them about vaccinations in their communities, as well as the impact that the pandemic has had on their communities and uh, seek their input on, uh, on how to manage. Uh, they are the leaders in those communities. They are best uh, informed as to how uh, we should uh, interact with them and how we can uh, work with them going forward to make sure that uh, when decisions are being made, they take into account uh, what the local uh, situation is and what their wishes and desires uh, and concerns are. So that's been happening uh, regularly. Uh, as I said, at least on a weekly basis or biweekly basis, depending on uh, what phase and what stage we are and what information there is to uh, discuss with those leaders, and that will continue. I have no uh, no doubt whatsoever, uh, and they are uh, very engaged with us, and uh, our goal is to make sure that uh, we are doing things in communities uh, in uh, in step with uh, what is best for each of those communities, and that's the best way to find out. So we have been doing that, and we'll continue to do that. Um, maybe that Dr. Hanley wants to add some more uh, detail about the actual numbers. Uh, I know there was some uh, opportunity to determine those numbers. I don't. I think there was a, a recent uh, media statement that uh, we had refused to release those numbers. I don't think that was the case. It was an opportunity to make sure that the numbers were up to date and accurate, and to confer with those communities. To to make sure that they were aware that that was going to be done. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Minister McPhee. I, I, I just had a few things, um, and uh, I, I think it's important uh, for one thing to recognize that what we call um, vaccine hesitancy is uh, is normal, is it's predictable. Uh, we we know, um, and I know I've mentioned this before, but with any vaccine campaign, you will always get a, a rapidly increasing slope, especially with um, in an emergency response, and then you will get a, a flattening of that curve as um, as the uptake um, amongst those people uh, who are holding back. Um, is uh, dictates that that kind of slower curve, so you have that that kind of rush of enthusiasm, which we we all love, but we know that there's always the, uh, the the ones that are waiting for for more time, for more information, or for other questions to be addressed, and we also know that there are ones that are uh, never going to come forth, and so it's working with the ones who who are in that kind of um, what you might call movable middle or the gray area, the the people that need more time need more specific questions answered uh, to, to work with them, to move them into the, uh, uh, the camp of receiving and, and, um, um, and comfortably receiving vaccine. It's not about uh, blame. It's not about not being successful. It's about identifying a, a, at the beginning as, as something that needs to be uh, addressed. And, and I think um, it's also not, um, uh, I guess, uh, a, just a question of... Um, uh, bringing people um, into the camp, I think it's um, this is this speaks to a really community efforts and, and community building efforts and uh, and working with communities and uh, the efforts within uh, rural communities um, and municipalities have been amazing in how they have uh, gone about uh, and whether it's picking people up or uh, addressing individual questions or or leaders um, vo vocalizing their support. Those, all of those things have been so important, or, or just simply assisting with, them, for instance, the mobile teams uh, rurally when they've gone out. So um, we have uh, a, um, we have people dedicated within our team who are um, having um, virtually daily conversations 
and identifying uh, and identifying where there are areas that we still need to address um, and uh, it might be around around logistics transport um, um, again specific medical questions ma and making sure those conversations are ongoing and as Minister Murphy says continuing to engage uh, with le uh, leadership and uh, and leaders so I guess in short Hesitancy is there. It takes uh, the, the the less people you have uh, in that remaining, the more time it takes. Uh, so we have to we have to recognize it. It, it takes time, but we are uh, we we are working together to make um, progress, and uh, it's making a difference. Do you have another question, Jackie? I do, and just before I ask that, I want to uh, correct the minister. Uh, the premier did, in fact, say pitting one community against another community um, will have everyone speculating or pointing fingers. I don't think that's going to necessarily help the safety of Yukoners, so I don't believe it was ever about preparation of numbers. Uh, the premier previously said the numbers would not be released. But my second question is in related to Pfizer, um, and it's for Dr. Hanley. I think last week I had asked about it, and you had said the Yukon is considering all options, um, but just logistically it would make more sense to stay the course with Moderna. So I'm wondering what changed in that week? Um, how long have discussions about obtaining Pfizer been underway? And again, just some of the logistics of getting youth vaccinated. For example, will youth be able to walk into the vaccine clinic as adults in the White Horse Vaccine Clinic, as adults have. Yeah. Um, so what you're, you're right, uh, Jackie. What what I did say is that in, in an ideal world, <laughs> that we would uh, we, we would uh, get the Moderna and um, and, and see Moderna being um, being approved and, and and go with that. But as I said, we were looking at the other options and. Uh, and really, from the beginning of the knowing uh, that uh, Pfizer was um, going to be ahead in getting approval for 12 to 15, 12 to 17, we we've been uh, looking at that um, possibility, and uh, of course, conferring with our colleagues in NWT and elsewhere that had gone out um, earlier, and and just looking at okay, can um, can can we do this? What would it take? What what needs to be deferred? What needs to be delayed? Um, and and uh, what uh, how would we get the supplies? So all of those were going on, just so we knew what our options were. And I think uh, it became clear there was strong, um, strong public interest, um, as well as um, aligning, I guess, with our um, uh, self-isolation adjustments for fully vaccinated. I think that increased the case for um, going as early as we could, uh, recognizing that that degree of public interest. So I, I think it's really just responding to what's possible and what uh, what we knew the uh, the interest and demand was um, uh, from from our public, and just seeing if we could do it. I do think uh, again. Um, we, I, I think Moderna won't be that far behind, and and will will of course be of course be watching with interest for the um, applications and approvals for Moderna based on their trials. So that I think, as I said, that will become an option later on as well. So, the, but this is the early bird option, I guess. Um, the uh, so I. Um, I don't have a lot of details sort of operationally. We, we do, of course, immunize adolescents for lots of other things, and, and it is uh, based on, a, um, on, on uh, consent rules, um, what we call mature minor consent. Uh, so at, at a certain age, uh, an, uh, an adolescent is able to actually consent themselves, so they, they would be um, able to uh, walk in and receive that independently. But of course, for younger children, there there will be a, a consent process. So I think more on those sorts of details will will come, and I hesitate to speak uh, too, um, too far ahead of the, um, the, the people actually doing the, the, the immunizing and the operations. Thank you. We'll move now to Luke, CKRW. Hi, I'm wondering about uh, more of the logistics with the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, is it expected that all of the doses uh, that are going to be reserved for Yukon youth are going to come all in one shipment to avoid any delays? And if so, when will that uh, shipment arrive? 
I, I, I can take a crack at that. Again, I, I don't have the day-to-day -day details. I mean, these, these are discussions that are, you know, happening, kind of, you know, very um, at, at uh, um, uh, you know, from day-to-day -day, uh, requests, um, the, the request from our uh, department and our deputy minister went to the uh, to the National Operations Center and and was recognized. But in terms, uh, and it will align with the other, you know, the, uh, as you know, Pfizer comes in weekly shipments and is distributed throughout Canada. So, w of course, what we're asking is a, a relatively small uh, number of doses uh, to um, uh, to to be enough for our, our 2,600 uh, young people, which uh, yeah, is um, yeah a relatively small amount compared to the to the now the numbers of doses that are in the millions for for Pfizer. So it's just um, uh, ensuring that um, we um, reserved our our supply, but the actual. Uh, I don't have that information on the actual uh, arrival date. We do know that the, the planning will, of course, incorporate that um, th that assurance of when the supply will be um, in territory and turned around fast enough so that we have a comfortable margin um, uh, to be able to mo mobilize the the vaccine uh, according to the schedule, and that's that's again making sure all of those those details are in place before we um, bef be before we announce the uh, actual dates. Do you have a second question, Luke? <clears throat> no, just the one question for me. Thank you. We'll now move to Nick, Canadian Press. Hi. Um, again, I think this might kind of fall in the similar vein of questions that have been asked, but is there any kind of timeline on when exactly students can expect to, or youth rather, can expect to receive that first dose of vaccine? I know um, that the health minister said it'd be by the end of the school year, but is there any kind of firmer dates? Uh, well, I can tell you, Nick, that uh, our school year ends here in the territory around the middle of June. So uh, certainly within the next, we're, we're now at the 12th of May, so uh, within the next four weeks, uh, for sure, um, we uh, anticipate uh, lining up the logistics and, uh, and having uh, individuals deliver those vaccines in the communities across the territory uh, in the next four weeks. So uh, it will, as Dr. Hanley has said, be based on when the shipment arrives and how the tight those timelines can be. They will be very strict and tight uh, because of the initial planning uh, information that we have is that uh, uh, there will be staffing and logistical issues. But uh, uh, as Dr. Uh, Hanley has said, very pleased to have secured the uh, Pfizer vaccine so that our youth uh, can begin uh, being vaccinated uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Do you have a second question? No, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move to Tim, Whitehorse Star. Yeah. Um, so my first question is probably more for, uh, actually I guess it could be for either one of them. Just logistically speaking and with the Pfizer vaccine, uh, do we have the super cold refrigerators here uh, to house them or is that no longer needed? <laughs> yeah. So um, yes, we we do have the um, the, the freezer capacity, um, and and of course that was one of the important things to check off. Um, but uh, yeah, the yeah the freezer capacity, uh, which is um, enough storage room within the within the freezer and the ability to go to that minus seventy uh, range. Um, so yes, we have. But as I said, the um, you don't uh, you don't need one of those freezers in every uh, community uh, because of the ability now to um, to uh, uh, um, decant, as it were, into um, into normal freezer temperatures for a limited period of time, which would allow that that uh, rollout to occur. Thanks, Tim. Do you have a second question? 
Yes, and this one is, uh, again, for either one of you. I've been reading a number of uh, articles lately in some national uh, publications uh, dealing with vaccine hesitancy. One of the ideas that keeps coming up is uh, the suggestion that perhaps we should be paying people to get the vaccine. Any thoughts? You know, uh, I would say, uh, you know, all kinds of um, all kinds of things come up <laughs> um, in terms of uh, issues that that would, in, would entail. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's um, it, it would bring up questions of. What about those who have been vaccinated um, already? Um, are you coercing people? Um, so I think we have to be just very careful when we draw, when when we go into um, the, um, uh, the the line of um, pushing people or coercing more than uh, they might otherwise have gone. And, and I think our approaches based on conversations, based on addressing specific questions that people have, and uh, looking for other kinds of incentives. Um, so what's, you know, we know that, for example, um, some people have been holding back for individual benefit, and that's that's very real and it's very normal. So that uh, that uh, certainly influenced our um, movement to have differential um, self isolation requirements, so that people um, do see an, an individual incentive that they can have uh, the uh, the ability to uh, return from travel and um, and not have to self isolate. And and of course we're we're seeing the effect effects of that. Um, so uh, so that, uh, th that's a complicated question. There's no easy answer to that. Uh, but I would say it, it brings up all kinds of uh, issues of, of equity, uh, uh, justice, and um, uh, over over um, the possibility of over over coercion, but it's not to not to mean that perhaps there are other ways to look at uh, look at other types of incentives. I think the concept of incentives is uh, is one of the tools that that we should continue to look at. Minister McPhee, thank you. I just wanted to add. Uh, Tim, to your question, thank you for that. Uh, it's really important for us to remember that we have been wildly successful with vaccines here in the territory, uh, and there have been uh, opportunity for people to be vaccinated, which has been a, a key component uh, of that. Um, we have had uh, much success as a community uh, for um, uh, having uh, uptake uh, on vaccines, and I think, as Dr. Hanley has said, uh, one of the most important things to do if there is vaccine hesitancy is to address the issues that are of concern for people. There will be always a number of people who are uh, not prepared uh, to be vaccinated for uh, whatever uh, choice, but as Dr. Handley spoke earlier uh, about the individuals who might have uh, concerns that could be allayed or issues that could be addressed, I think that's uh, our goal is to make sure that we're addressing those concerns for every single Yukoner. Thank you. We'll move now to Haley, Yukon News. Thank you. Um, my first question, I hate to always be uh, on these calls asking for what happens next, when do we get more, but I'm not familiar with the literature. Dr. Hanley, um, are we expecting to see the vaccines um, gradually becoming available for even younger children than 12? Yes, uh, yeah, we will. Um, and uh, there are trials. Uh, clin there's still, uh, as I understand, still phase three clinical trials not uh, in progress uh, for um, Pfizer, Moderna, and I, I believe for AstraZeneca as well. And uh, others, uh, of course, there are other vaccines in the pipeline um, as well. Um, so, uh, so there are trials for six months up to uh, 12 years um, underway. So we would, uh, we will expect eventually. I don't have any, uh, any kind of timelines for that, but, but I, um, apart from what, uh, I, I, what I understand is we would be sort of looking sort of late summer into fall for a availability, a potential availability of vaccine for uh, younger kids. 
Thank you. Do you have a second question, Haley? Uh, my second question, so far, you know, we haven't seen restrictions um, on people who, who haven't been vaccinated. I'm wondering, as um, this youth cohort are vaccinated before the school year, do you anticipate at any point that we'll see um, restrictions or documentation required for the COVID-19 vaccine for children attending school? So um, it, it's a good question. I would say that um, uh, it has not been our practice to um, to either recommend or to put in place restrictions based on vaccine status. Um, we haven't done that for other um, immunizations uh, for school kids. I do. Uh, I do think there's merit in the idea of uh, documentation. Um, it's not a, a policy option that has been pursued here in detail, but I do think it's uh, worth looking at. Not not just for COVID vaccine, but for other uh, childhood immunizations. Um, and there is, for instance, the model in, in BC, again, not for COVID, but for other childhood immunizations where that uh, documentation is requested. And, and, and it's really just so then uh, those, if there is, um, if, uh, if there are incomplete vaccines, at least a conversation can take place. And again, along the lines of what Minister McPhee was describing, that you know those questions and concerns can be can be addressed in conversations, and and it's and, and it's more that rather than saying you know you must or that this vaccine is mandatory, making sure that um, that the uh, documentation is provided, I think, can be a good way to go forward. But at, at uh, currently, there there is no uh, process um, in place uh, like that. And I don't. Uh, I don't. I also think that we, you know. Again, we've shown that with observance of protocols and public health measures within schools, uh, and that we can also do this uh, very well. Um, and uh, and and the vaccines are going to add yet another layer of of protection and assurance that we can um, operate our schools even if uh, a COVID uh, threat uh, continues into the next year. Thank you, Haley. On va maintenant passer au Vincent Radio Canada. Oui, bonjour Madame la Ministre, bonjour Dr. Amé. Euh, une première question euh, sur la vaccination, est-ce que vous pouvez revenir en français sur le fait sur cette vaccination des jeunes, euh, expliquer pourquoi c'est maintenant possible et en quoi c'est important de, de les inclure dans la campagne de vaccination? Oh, Dr. Henley, could you please repeat in French uh, why we are going to vaccinate youth at this point and why it's important for the whole campaign in general? Oui, merci pour la question. Euh, maintenant, euh, on, a, on a fait beaucoup de travail récemment pour, pour examiner toutes les options pour les adolescents et les jeunes entre les âges 12 et euh, 17. Et euh, maintenant, on, on est euh, dans une position d'annoncer qu'on a, euh, a un accord pour... Euh, pour euh, accéder, euh, pour, pour avoir euh, la, le vaccin Pfizer qui, 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 qui va couvrir euh, les, euh, ceux, qui, ceux qui veulent venir euh, entre les âges de 12 et 17 ans. Euh, et ça, ça sera bientôt dans, dans le territoire. Et donc, les dates finales euh, seront annoncées bientôt. Euh, on, on est juste en, en train de finaliser tous les plans pour, euh, pour, le, le, pour, pour les livraisons et pour l'administration de vaccins. Donc, ça va ajouter une autre couche, euh, non seulement pour ces jeunes-là, pour, euh, pour, pour les protéger. On, on a vu avec... Euh, l'expérience euh, des variants euh, euh, dans, dans, dans les autres territoires, euh, surtout le territoire nord-ouest, mais aussi euh, euh, avec le progrès de pan pandémique au Canada, on, on voit que les variants sont... Les, les jeunes sont plus, plus susceptibles au euh, COVID-19, euh, surtout euh, quand il s'agit des, des variantes. Donc, c'est important pour protéger les jeunes, mais ça aussi, ça ajoute à la taux de, de vaccins pour la population. Donc, ça, ça va diminuer la possibilité de 
transmission de, de virus euh, dans la communauté. Et comme ça, ça va aider euh, à, à, à protéger toute, toute la communauté. Merci. Avez-vous une autre question, Vincent? Ah oui, merci. Euh, la deuxième question, vous parlez du second dose summer. Euh, et donc, on a parlé la semaine dernière de la possibilité voilà, de, de nouvelles mesures que les, les Yukonais complètement vaccinés pourront revenir sans quarantaine au territoire. Euh, et justement, vous l'avez rappelé aussi, les voyages non essentiels seront toujours déconseillés au pays. Alors, certains Canadiens qui commencent déjà à penser aux vacances, euh, est-ce qu'on peut dire, euh, quel est votre point de vue là-dessus, sur est-ce que le, le territoire est tout ouvert au tourisme cet été So uh, you have said that uh, you're uh, relaxing some of the measures that uh, people who are fully vaccinated will be able to come and or to get out of the territory. Uh, do you have the impression that we will have a full tourism season this year or is it going to be uh, still kind of uh, limited as it is right now? Uh, c'est une très bonne question et je vais expliquer uh, peut-être dans les deux langues uh, uh, parce que c'est une chance de réemphasiser uh, les uh, l'état le, du Canada. Donc, uh, non, c'est pas c'est pas une invitation de tourisme pour cet été. Uh, c'est plutôt une transition uh, graduelle pour ouvrir les possibilités pour pour les Yukonais et um, Um, pour, um, pour, um, um, pour reconnaître uh, qu'il y, y en a beaucoup hein, entre les Yukonais qui, qui, qui veulent avoir l'opportunité de, de, de voyager, de visiter des familles um, uh, des, um, pour avoir ces opportunités um, et d'avoir aussi un incentive, uh, une, une motivation pour les gens de venir pour le vaccin. Mais le paradoxe, c'est qu'au même temps, et dans, on est dans une position à ce moment de, où euh, le voyage euh, n'est pas conseillé pour les Canadiens, à part de raisons essentielles. Donc, c'est de, de peut-être euh, euh, de mettre les racines euh, maintenant pour la possibilité de voyager dans, dans, le, dans le futur. Et, et c'est un futur qui n'est pas loin, c'est dans les semaines et, et euh, de à venir euh, quand on voit la, la taux d'activité de COVID au Canada euh, commence à diminuer, surtout dans certaines provinces. On, on sait qu'on on sera possible de graduellement ouvrir les possibilités pour voyager. Au même temps, euh, il, faut, euh, il faut attendre que la situation stabilise au Canada avant qu'on puisse vraiment ouvrir les portes hein, pour le tourisme. Tout le monde veut qu'on puisse recevoir, acquérir, acquérir les, les touristes euh, ici encore, mais on sait que c'est euh, trop tôt, c'est trop tôt, mais c'est une chance pour nous pour graduellement euh, commencer les étapes pour arriver euh, à ce but. I, I just think it's worth repeating uh, because the question has been asked often, um, uh, are we opening the doors to uh, tourism by inviting, um, inviting Canadians uh, who have a full vaccination into the territory? And, and uh, w what I tried to explain is, um, No, this is a this this may seem paradoxical, but we do have to, I think, fundamentally recognize that this is still a time when non-essential travel is not um, is is uh, is not advised, and in fact, uh, severely restricted in many parts of Canada. So what we're doing is we're laying the roots and laying the foundations for gradual uh, reopening. This is not an invitation for uh, tourists uh, into Yukon uh, at the moment because that, that is not the way that uh, Canada is positioned. But we, there will be a time and we are gradually laying, laying those steps beginning with that ability for uh, people with um, a, a full uh, vaccine status to be able uh, not to self-isolate when they return to Yukon. We know that that uh, practically applies to uh, 
primarily Yukoners because Yukoners um, um, with their territorial uh, account, our territorial counterparts have the most uh, people uh, per population in that um, uh, status of having um, having full vaccination status. So it's uh, there is almost a natural phasing in because uh, because there are actually very few Canadians who would be eligible um, at this point. But we know that week by week, month by month, there will be more and more people achieving second dose. So it's a, uh, there's a kind of a natural phasing in ability, and we will be watching carefully and um, as Canada stabilizes so that we can align ourselves when travel opens up, we will be well positioned to uh, to 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 move along with that uh, gr gradual reopening to travel. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. The next COVID-19 update will take place on Wednesday, May 19th at 10.30 a.m.